welcome. I'm super excited that you're all here with us today and we're going to get started. So um, <laughs> I love this picture, um, but we're not talking about your worst nightmare. We're actually talking about the amazing gift that each generation brings to the workplace. So our topic today is millennials are people too. And our objective as we walk through our conversation is helping you understand a little bit more about generations. And today it's my distinct honor to introduce to you um, my friend and colleague, Dr. Katherine Jeffrey, welcome. Thank you, great to be here. Uh, Catherine has extensive experience, not only um, in her studies, but also directly working with uh, the millennial generation understanding them, speaking with them. And so we're going to benefit from her insights and wisdom as we uh, walk through this presentation today. So what is it that we're talking about today? Um, a couple key things. As I mentioned, um, we're going to start off with the reality check. Um, I always find it fascinating when we look at the statistics about what's actually going on in the workplace and the impact of generations in the workplace. So we're going to talk about that first. And then we're going to explore, is this generation stuff for real? Um, or is it just something that they made up? Is it really fake news? And if it's not, and generations are for real, then how do I fit in? What's the generation I belong in? We're going to do some millennial myth busting. And um, our goal ultimately is to increase generational awareness. And we're going to talk about some practical tools and next steps you can take to address generational bias. So all of that in just an hour, let's get started. So Catherine, tell us what's happening in the workplace. Yeah, so to set some context overall for the conversation, let's first talk about what's happened in the workplace over really the past century, um, and then focus in on what's going on today. So we think about a lot of the organizations that exist today, the traditionalists built them. Then the boomers came in and shaped the values and beliefs. Then Gen Xers being small but mighty, there's about 20 million fewer Gen Xers. They came in, they built a lot of the systems in the organizations and they did manage to create some change in terms of workplace flexibility. But overall, they joined a status quo that has existed for literally more than half a century, mm -hmm. right? Gen Xers had to play by the rules. They really had no other choice. And then millennials entered the scene and things have changed, right? The way they view the world of work, the way they interact at work, um, it's, a very, it's a very different context. Now we have five generations with Gen Z entering the workforce. They've been in the workforce for a year and a half, two years now. So we have five generations working alongside of each other, trying to make it work. And that's the first time ever that this has happened. And recently, The Economist did a study and found um, that age has become the largest diversity issue in North America. Wow, that's amazing. That's something I don't hear about. Like we hear a lot about diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, but that age is, or generations, I guess, and age is such a, a significant issue. Yeah, it's causing a ton of tension. Sometimes you just mention a certain generation and people will literally turn red in the neck. They have a physical reaction. <laughs> and you're like, okay, everybody calm down. We can get through this, right? Wow. And, you know, if we think about what's happening even in the near future, by 2025, millennials will make up 75% of the workforce. So we can't mm -hmm. ignore the changes. We mm -hmm. can't act like they're not happening. I mean, we, we can, right? But there's going to be consequences to exactly. that. Exactly. And uh, Gallup has done a study and found that millennial turnover is costing the U.S. economy over $30 billion every year. Wow. Yeah, they're, they, they only stay at a job typically between three to five years. And when you, when you talk to a baby boomer about that, where loyalty was a high value, mm -hmm. they, they just can't understand you know, why a millennial wouldn't right. stay. And yeah. um, so, so, so those are just some of the things occurring right now that are impacting the workplace and how we get along. Fascinating. So before we explore more about the generations, I want to understand does this really matter? Because, you know, sometimes I feel like talking about generations is sort of hocus pocus. 
You know, it's like something that, I don't know, some researchers made up, right? Just because it sounded like, oh yeah, we can, we can segregate people into different groups. And I hate being put in a box. <laughs> so, um, so tell me about this. Why, what is the deal with generations? Yeah, I think when we, you know, it's easy to stereotype people in a generation. I think that's when people get really frustrated with this conversation. But what we have to keep in mind is when we look at the generations, it's really, we need to think about it as a helpful framework to look at the shifts that have taken place in our culture and our society. So because these shifts is ha have these shifts have happened over time, mm -hmm. the way we look at the world as depending on when we were born and the way we look at the world of work even mm -hmm. shifts with time. Absolutely. All right. So that's a really helpful explanation just to understand that when I was born influences how I experienced the world because of the exactly. way I grew up. Okay. All right. So with that, um, before we talk about what the generations are, let's do a personal environmental scan. So we often think of the, of the environment as the weather going on around us. In this case, we're going to talk about and reflect on growing up. So when you grew up, what kind of family system were you in? Um, was that an intact family with a mom and dad? Did you have some uncles and aunts around? That's a very different growing up experience than if you come from a single parent environment or if you were adopted or there's so many different family structures, right? So that's a really big impact. Um, so that's one factor. So then think about technology. And Catherine, what are some of the kinds of technological things we consider when we're doing an environmental scan? Like how we grew up? So like, I remember growing up and Atari was like the big thing, right? Wow, that was amazing. And even, it was funny, I was listening to a, um, a presentation the other day and he was talking about, we used to have black and white televisions that you would get up and turn the channel, right? That right. seems like right. impossible <laughs> to imagine, but that's how it was for me, right? Technology. And there's other generations who may remember before television even existed. Right, where you sat around the radio and you didn't even know what the people looked like who yes. you were hearing. Yeah. Yes. And another yeah. funny example, we are talking about this, um, the sound of cha-ching. Yeah. You know, like we, had, we understand that's a cash register, but for gen a whole generation, they have never seen like a true operational yep. cash register, yep. right? Yep. Because of the evolution of technology. So that's another factor. Mm -hmm. um, Huge in, factor. In your environment. Yeah. Um, another one is ec economic conditions, right? Mm -hmm. So what was going on around you? If there was a recession... Um, even though that may not impact you directly, although it probably did, mm -hmm. um, that shapes how you think about the world, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, I know when I was graduating college, I was one of two people in my major to get a job. So that has an in impact on me, right? Absolutely. On how I view the world. Mm -hmm. um, so the economic conditions that existed as you grew up, kids who grew up in the 80s have a different outlook, right, than on other generations just because of how the economy was. Mm -hmm. Then organizations. So talk about this in terms of a shaping factor personally. Yeah, well, it's really what did, what did organizations mean to you, right? How did they, have they failed you? Have they helped you? What do they stand for in your life and during that time in history? And we'll get into that more. In, From in a generation yeah. standpoint. Yeah. Okay. Is that something like I belonged to Girl Scouts when I grew up or... Yeah, that's part of it. Like, okay. because you value that, that's where you found your community and how has that evolved over time? Okay. So that's another factor. So again, for each of you listening, be thinking about what your family was like, what your experience was with technology as you were growing up, the economic conditions that existed, the organizations you were affiliated with. And the last one is shared experiences. So um, we, I put the example here, like 9-11, um, for some people, they talk about when there was a man put on the moon or when John F. Kennedy was shot. There's a lot of um, shared experiences that define generations. So that's another kind of factor. And as you're thinking through your own personal environment, what are some of those kind of defining events that there is a shared experience um, in your generation? So as you think about that, now we actually want to look at those factors in more, more detail. Yeah. So from a generational 
perspective, when we think about family, when boomers were growing up, they were, as kids, they were to be seen and not heard. And so they were pretty determined not to raise their kids in that same way. And Dr. Spock was on the scene talking about self-esteem. So that was a high value. And then Gen X came along. A lot of women had entered the workforce. And so they became known as the latchkey kid. They came home, they might have started dinner, they did their homework. So it started to play into, a, you know, a lot of Gen Xers are independent and very flexible and adaptable as a result. And then millennials were the first generation to call their parents their friends. So that really, you know, and a lot of times we bring our values, our, our values, our family system values into the workplace. Mm -hmm. And that shapes how we think we should be treated in the workplace and the expectations we have. And more and more millennials are seeing the workplace as an extended family. In fact, over 80% of them want to feel like it's a second family. And so those values and the things that shape them in their home when they simply have, you know, they were invited to have conversations with their parents, right? Mm -hmm. Their opinion mattered, their, their voices were heard. And so they expect that in the workplace, right? And yeah. they're also, they're used to, you know, another thing people get upset with that I think ties directly back to family is millennials want a lot of feedback. Mm -hmm. And, but they're used to having those conversations with their parents and they're used to giving their parents feedback as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So different shaping structures. It's interesting exactly. that you should say that, Catherine. I was talking with a leader recently who just discovered this, right? So he said, wow, in my position, I had no idea that many of the individuals that work here see this as a family. So when there's any disruption, it really disturbs them at a whole new level. Where it used to be, you know, there was, um, the, you know, your work life and your personal life. Exactly. It's Very all, separate. Yeah. It's all the same now because yeah. the, that generation has learned to understand their workspace as a family. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. So next shaping factor is technology. Yeah, technology. If you think about boomers in the early 1950s, only 4 million homes had TVs. And then by the late 1950s, like 40 million homes, right? So so TVs kind of flooded the market. So then Gen X grew up in a world where TVs were their babysitter for a lot of them. And MTV, right, yes. was the, the most preferred station. We all probably, those of us who are of that age, remember the first video that was aired during that time. And mm -hmm. yeah, we spent a lot. We spent over 23, I think it's like 23,000 hours by the time mm -hmm. we were 20, a typical Gen Xer. And then, you know, the remote control, Gen Xers, their understanding of diversity expanded because now they could see people of different ethnicities in their own living room, mm -hmm. right? Where boomers would have watched more of the radio growing up or watched, right? <laughs> quote, in quotes, air quotes. Um, but yeah, now Gen X is actually seeing people that don't look like them and that come from other places. And for Gen Xers, the microwave came to be. So that started to evolve how we do things, how we look at the world and the speed with which we want things to happen. I remember when my mom said, we're never getting a microwave because we will all die, right? That was a very real fear. And then for millennials, you know, cell phones came to be, right? And TiVo. So I don't even have to watch commercials anymore. I can now just watch what I want, when I want, right? Mm -hmm. Much more of that on-demand lifestyle. And then Gen Z, you know, Skype, texting, iPads, Apple Watch. I mean, they've seen constant change in technology mm -hmm. and really expect they're just waiting for the next big thing because it's pretty constant in this mm -hmm. world today. So what we're learning is um, it's not just that these are technologies we're familiar with, but the very way those technologies were part of our history shapes our expectation in the workplace. Okay. And that's something we can take for granted. Exactly. All right, let's talk about economic conditions. Yeah, if you think about the boomers were the wealthiest generation, right? I have an aunt who grew up with two sisters and they had one pair of roller skates between wow. the three of them. So of course, she wanted all of her kids to have their own pair of roller skates, mm -hmm. right? So that even the way we think about how we spent our money and what was valuable to us, Gen Xers watched the economy tank in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And millennials, you know, we, we hear all the time about the college debt they faced. 
Gen Z has grown up during a time of recession with Gen X parents who have lost jobs. So they tend to be more skeptical, right? They're more, a lot of Gen Zers have like four or five part-time gigs they're even pulling off because they feel that angst for money and they've heard about all the debt the millennials are in, right? So they want to do something different. So it's, mm -hmm. it's shaped the way they maybe will hang on to a job or let go of a job or mm -hmm. want to, um, have flexibility within that job. For sure. All right, and then organizations. Do so you think about the traditional as they started a lot of organizations and really they believe organizations are for the people. We're building this organization so we mm -hmm. can serve the greater good. Mm -hmm. And boomers, it was by the people. We're the ones running these. We're gonna take this organization to the next level. We're gonna grow something here. And then Gen Xers, the skeptical ones, came in and they, and they watched this happen. They watched organizations fail people. So, so there's mm -hmm. a huge shift. Mm -hmm. And then millennials and Gen Z are really like, well, we are the organizations, right? Now we have social media, mm -hmm. so we can make that impact. And we don't need all these politics and this red tape and these these huge failures we're watching leaders have, we can just do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. So really different perspectives on the organization itself, which leads to some of the frustration in the workplace. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's interesting. One of the, one of the other um, things that's real, but I hadn't even thought about it, strategy, which is something, you know, a lot of organizations find is really important, although it's more and more challenging because of the pace of change um, that didn't even exist as a discipline in the workplace until like the 50s or 60s. So some of these things that we take for granted have always been there, actually we're not. Because to your point, the way that people interacted and viewed organizations was really different. So um, yeah, it's, I see more shifts happening. And if we maintain the same mindset about the organization that we kind of learned, then we won't be able to really integrate or understand other generations. So that's what I'm hearing is part of the challenge. Absolutely. All right. And finally, shared experiences. Yes. Yeah, so even if you think about the way, like the things we've, the world has gone through, let me mm -hmm. say it that way, um, over the years, right? Traditionalists, World War II was happening. Mm -hmm. For boomers, it was the Vietnam War, civil rights, hippies, Gen X. Gen Xers watched the space shuttle Challenger explode and mm -hmm. saw the teacher who was a formative person in their life at that point, right? Your teacher means everything when you're younger and mm -hmm. you watched Krista McAuliffe die in space, right? right. I mean, that shapes the way you think about technology, that mm -hmm. shapes the way you think about the future. For, for millennials, 9-11 was obviously a huge event and Gen Z, you know, they can't even go to school without the fear of gun violence and mm -hmm. potentially being shot. Right? Mm -hmm. so, it, so even, you know, we used to think of school as a very safe place and right. get excited to go there. So they naturally have anxiety. Mm -hmm. So all of those factors shape us and that's why we have generations, yep. right? Yeah. That's, that's what, what creates these different the framework within the generations. Right? Yeah. So before you walk through the framework, we mm -hmm. um, want to say that it's, we're not putting people in boxes, just that there's general um, constructs in each of those areas that kind of ref are reflected in the generations. Yeah. And I would say, you know, you can self identify as a millennial would say, right. To the generation where you really feel like it fits and, a couple ways to define what a generation is, is one is shared experiences, which we just talked about. And I think we can all agree that those things have shaped who we are and how we see the world. And then in the past, generations were typically defined by a 20 year span of birth dates. And what they're seeing now is that's evolving much more quickly due to technology. So they're saying generations now are turning over about every eight years. Wow. And I really believe this because whenever I do a presentation or speak to, you know, work with a company, um, I will say, who in here is a millennial? And they'll raise their hand and then they'll say, well, I'm a millennial, but I'm not really a millennial. Okay. And what they're relating to, so then I throw out, some of you may have heard who a 
what a zenial is. And a zenial is an older millennial who grew up with an analog childhood and a digital adulthood. They still played outside when they were young. And they, the, you know, their favorite video game at school was the Oregon Trail. And they're like, yes, that's me, that's me, right? So millennials have even separated into two categories and it, it's been interesting. And I read somewhere like a month ago that generations are gonna turn over almost every year due to the speed of technology, which is something wow. that's hard to wrap your brain around, right? But in some ways, it really could happen, right? Our experiences could be that different. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's important to remember too, there are people who are on the cusp. So if you're kind of between a boomer and a Gen X, you may associate more with boomers because you may have older siblings. And so your family culture, you know, was mm -hmm. more kind of pulled you in that direction. So it's okay to not fit specifically between the, the birth dates on the screen. What is this all about? Yeah, so let's talk about when we when we look at the generations, just one simple way to kind of break down or, or show the changes is to think about communication. So with boomers, if any of your boomers out there, the word groovy, right, used to be a really hot word. For Gen Xers, dude, that's awesome. I mean, dude was like every other word out of a Gen X's mouth. Millennials the acronyms are everywhere. And I always let boomers know, don't worry. If you don't know what YOLO means, you can Google it. They're that popular. So that means you only live once for anyone who doesn't know. And then for Gen Z, it's all about the emoji, right? This is their hot word. And in 2015, this was actually the word of the year was the tears of joy emoji. And so I have people who say, well, I just sent out a recruiting email and I received back the signature line was a kissy face emoji. And they're like, what do I do with that? How do I respond? And so these are things you need to think about in your organization. They have, they have their own language that they use mm -hmm. with emojis. And my niece just went to college and I asked her how she felt about her new roommate. And she said, um, she was super excited. She had never met her, but they had the same texting language. And so the emojis they use, the way they use them was similar. So they could communicate well in that realm. And so we need to be aware of this, be prepared for it. Don't just discount somebody because they, they're speaking a different language, right? But just mm -hmm. seek to understand it. So for those of you in the audience, what were the words that you remember of your generation? Do you identify with those words, whether it was groovy or dude? Is there another one that would be like totally? <laughs> oh yeah, the valley girl. <laughs> yes. So that's fascinating that each generation sort of has their way of communicating, mm -hmm. which would make a lot of sense for why there can be breakdowns in the workplace, right? So we've got organizations where different people have perspectives on their, um, like what they expect. Like you shared about the example of the family, right? Like I want a family in my workplace. Whereas for other generations, it's I'm coming here to get my paycheck and go home and be with my family. Those are two really different points of view that can create tension and conflict in the workplace. So what are some of the other things um, in terms of conflict? Yeah, I could start with something as simple as a piece of paper, okay? So I've heard arguments between boomers and millennials where, you know, typically for a boomer, they want a piece of paper. They want to feel like they can walk away with something tangible. They mm -hmm. want to interact with it. They want to take notes on it. And millennials are like, you're killing a tree. Why did you have to print all these pieces of paper? Mm -hmm. And often what happens is the millennial can refuse to print it or, you know, yeah, to print the paper. Print yes. And then the boomer feels cheated. Right. Like and they're disrespected. not following along. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we have to decide what are we really trying to accomplish here? And is that piece of paper really that significant that we want to create this yeah. much angst around it? Yeah. Right? And that's interesting. You mentioned that I was just um, with a leadership team a, a week or two ago where the head of strategy was a boomer and wanted to share something with everybody, brought printouts into the room and the millennials kind of set them to the side and opened on their computers what they wanted to look at. 
so it's understanding that generational language and not that one's right or wrong, but recognizing we're all different. So and being willing to learn the differences too, right? Because you've yes. got different generations in the room. And so how can you meet them each where they're at? Yes. And so just like this slide illustrates, there's lots of different perspectives. So, all right. So we talked about paper as a yeah. silly example. <laughs> yeah, that's a good, right? just, yeah, a simple one, right? But even then, then you can get into even leadership, right? Mm -hmm. So when you think about the traditionalists and growing up during the war, mm -hmm. of course, a lot of these organizations were started with hierarchical leadership. That, mm -hmm. that makes a ton of sense. But now, and even in my dissertation research, what we found is, right, millennials have a very shared concept of leadership, and mm -hmm. it's more of a role that you hold, and, but it can easily be, you know, Donna, well, if you want to lead this, that's great. If you're more passionate about it, that's great. It might mean you have a little more responsibility in the moment, but they are 100% clear that it doesn't mean you have any more value than I do. And so one of the mistakes or one of the uh, miscommunications that can often happen is from a boomer perspective or older generations, well, I, I have the experience, I've been here, you should just do what I say because of who I am and what I bring to the table. And mm -hmm. millennials are like, well, no, that's not true. We're all in this together. Mm -hmm. Let's figure out whose strengths work where and let's you know, get to our end goal mm -hmm. in a very collaborative way. And so that, that can cause a lot of miscommunication mm -hmm. and we often have to, and it can, there can be a, a tug of war, like your the last slide, right? That, that tug of war that can break at any moment. Mm -hmm. So the impact then, we've got these different perspectives of what leadership is. And it's not that the millennials are wrong in their view of shared leadership, but the impact in the workplace is often that older leaders feel disrespected because of that point of view. Absolutely. And so that's, that's one example. And it's interesting. Um, there's another leadership team I was working with where um, many of the leaders are younger and they're feeling frustrated with their leader because that leader is not exemplifying what they believe leadership should be. And so I'm seeing this play out where it's like this, generational myths and the leader is operating fantastically within his paradigm of leadership. That's exactly how you should behave. And so is one right or wrong? I don't know, but they're different. And those differences are creating a ton of friction in this workplace and in many others. And I think that's what I often tell people is it, it's not good or bad or right or wrong. It's just the way it is. And if mm -hmm. we don't stop, just like in any system you operate in, if you don't mm -hmm. stop and really seek to understand, then you can't move forward together, right? Because right. you're going to keep missing each other. Yeah. And we're going to talk about the gifts in a little bit, but um, one of the things that this raises for me with the leadership is as a as an established leader you can feel frustrated right like they're disrespectful and they don't understand because you know they don't respect experience but yet that's not actually true right the they're valuing everybody equally so the older leader is not being related to in the way they expect but it doesn't mean that that younger person is being disrespectful Yes. And in fact, the lesson that can be learned is how to better collaborate because of the way that younger person views leadership and collaboration. Yep. And even the way with cell phones, right? A lot of, a lot of the younger generations have taught older people how to use one of the most powerful things in the world, mm -hmm. right? So when they look at older people, they're not like, well, you know more than me because they can look on Google and find out everything, <laughs> right? And, and they've been teaching you how to use your phone and the latest application on your phone, right? right? So there, even, and it's the first time in history where that's happened, where it's not just to direct the older generation, teaches the younger generation. Right. It's being flipped. And so rather than taking that very personally, because mm -hmm. we do, we feel that, we feel disrespected, we feel angry, we mm -hmm. feel de devalued. And rather than going there, making it about you, it's just understanding that they're just bringing what they have to the table and they kind of expect you to do the same, mm -hmm. but that they, they're not, they're not minimizing who you are. 
and yeah. what you bring. You raise a really interesting point I had not thought about with generations where knowledge and stories used to be something handed down from generation to generation. So hence like learning from the yes. wisdom of the elders. And now because information or fake news or pretend information, whatever it happens to be, <laughs> right, right um, is all available to everyone. So it's very much democratized access to whatever anybody wants to know. Yep. So in the past where you had to sit down with your, maybe your grandmother or your mother to learn how to bake a recipe, yep. you just look it up or watch a YouTube video. Right, it's right there. You, show you what you need to do. Yep. And so the very technology and access to information is teaching younger people a different way. Mm -hmm. So rather than feeling frustrated, it, you need to understand the context. Yep. Interesting. So what are some of the other different perspectives that um, exist in generations? Yeah, I would say when we think about growth, are you, pro are you growing your employees, right? That's one of the main things millennials are looking for. That's a high value to them. And often when a boomer thinks about growing in the workplace or development, it's in order to get ahead, right? They had to climb the ladder. There were 80 million of them. Uh, it was very political, so they had to compete. So any kind of growth they got was to get ahead or get to the top. Mm -hmm. Gen X watched the economy bottom out. And so they often are looking for, I want, I want to learn more skills so that I can be more flexible and adaptable. I want to have different options with my life. I want to be able to have this alternative job if I need it. They're mm -hmm. always waiting for the rug to be pulled out, right? Mm -hmm. And the millennials, it's all about self-improvement, right? I want to become who, who I'm meant to be. I want to become all that I can. Um, and Gen Z, you know, FOMO is a real thing. They've grown up watching Instagram. They see what all their friends are doing constantly. The, mm -hmm. the phone is an extension of who they are, and they really want to have rewarding experiences. So what are you doing to capture my attention and make this Make this fun for me and alive. Because if you mm -hmm. don't do it, I can easily find it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Which can be really annoying, right? If you're a leader and you're like, well, why should I have to do that? But what we have to understand is that those contexts that each generation grew up in created a set of expectations and now we're left to manage them. Yep. Um, I wanted to um, raise a really excellent po point that Omar made where he was saying that one of the frustrations as a millennial is the lack of willingness um, for people who have been in the workplace a little bit longer to see or view younger people as partners. So uh, kind of almost automatically discounting because you're young and inexperienced, quote unquote, right? Then you don't have as much value because I've been here longer. Absolutely. In fact, I have talked to many millennials who are even afraid to admit that they're millennial because there's so much there's so much bad press out there mm -hmm. and they are they're tired of it and they want to be treated as an equal and they want to be respected so they're changing the way they dress they even change the kind of conversations they talk about at work because they're afraid to talk about things that might matter to them so mm -hmm. they adapt their conversations and and yeah it's, it's a big issue and i think What's happening is the older generations, as they think about transitioning, transitioning leadership, they're going to miss out because they're not, they're going to overlook and not see the very people who are helping to build what they're creating because millennials bring so much to the table mm -hmm. and it's not just technology, by the way, <laughs> they're kind of tired of hearing that all the time too. Yeah. <laughs> More than technology. So, um, should we transition to millennials or do you want to cover a couple more differences? Uh, yeah, we can do a couple more differences. I think a, a simple one is um, responding to change. Traditionalists mm. and boomers typically don't like it. They, you know, and especially if you think about where they are in terms of their career with the boomers, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of them are starting to transition out or at least think about it. And so why do I want to change? I've worked so hard to get where I'm at. This mm -hmm. is what's worked since I've been here. So I don't want to learn all this new stuff. That feels overwhelming right? Mm -hmm. um, Gen Xers tend to be more flexible. So change isn't always a bad thing for them. In fact, a lot of them really enjoy it. And then and millennials actually, believe it or not, what we hear over and over again is that they crave structure. So as long as you can guide them through the change and help them understand what to expect and what's coming, 
then they typically will do well. And then Gen Z, they want change. They're ready for it because the world has changed rapidly since they've gone through their life mm -hmm. and they're ready for the next big thing. I mean, they've seen, again, Skype, Facebook, YouTube, iPhones, Apple Watches, right? So what, what, what's coming at me? <laughs> so um, before we talk about some of the gifts, um, you talked about millennials. And that was the title of our presentation, actually, that it's not just about criticizing millennials. So where did this all come from? Because it, like you said, it seems like all you hear about is all the bad stuff about millennials. Is it really true? Like, what, what's the deal? Here? <laughs> not at all. In fact, when I first started doing my dissertation research, millennials were just known as the collaboration generation. That's all that was being said about them. It was very positive. And then the Time Magazine article hit that called that this was in 2013 and it called millennials lazy, narcissistic, and entitled. And this is when, and I think because of technology and the way we spread news today, right? This because Gen X, you know, we were all going to fail the world too, but now millennials just got everywhere. And so people really started buying into that. And we've probably all met some. Uh, millennials who may fit into some of those stereotypes, but um, that is certainly not the case for the generation, right? There's, there, there's, we're all over the map in every generation. And if the only thing we can do is think of that negative example, then I would say you're either hiding under a rock or you're not trying very hard to understand where they're coming from and who they are. So some people will say, well, they're asking for too much. They're entitled. They want this or that. I didn't get that. And I would say the reality is that they can have that, that the world has changed in such a way that these things are possible. Uh, one story I think of in this moment is there was a, a big accounting firm downtown Chicago, and there was this 27-year-old who they believed was going to help move them into the future. And they put him on this big project team and they paired him with one of the senior partners. And it was the first day of the big meeting and everyone was there except this 27 year old. So his boss is freaking out. Where is this guy? This is his big <laughs> opportunity. Oh my gosh. So of course he calls him and the guy answers and he's like, where are you? And he's, the millennial says, well, what do you mean? Where am I? And he says, well, we're, we're in this meeting, you know, where are you? We're expecting you. And he said, well, it's a beautiful day. I figured I'd just call in from the lake. And as you can imagine, the older generations in that room are furious, right? Because that's not the way we do things. But to that millennial, he didn't wake up saying, gosh, I hope I do something today that gets me fired. That wasn't on his mind at all, right? But the way he sees the world and his, his opportunity within the space of work and the mm -hmm. flexibility that is now available through technology, that just makes sense to him. But he mm -hmm. wasn't being disrespectful. That right. wasn't at all the real, you know, what was behind it all. Mm -hmm. But the way it's interpreted could literally have led to him being fired and losing his opportunity. Wow. And so when we immediately jump and we place our values and beliefs, beliefs on the millennial generation who have grown up in a very different world, we're missing out. Yeah. We could probably talk a lot more, but the point on that is really that a precedent was set, right? There was expectations that this is how the generation is. And it seems like all the press is about explaining how this generation's fitting those expectations. Mm -hmm. And what we're saying is that's actually not the case. No, I mean, there's amazing rock star millennials all over. <laughs> yeah. And they bring incredible value. Yeah. But to your point, we need to understand each other better. So um, tell us the story of the smiley eggs. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so when we think about bias in the workplace, I think of this photo. So imagine that it's your birthday and your spouse, your partner, your roommate, whomever says, Hey, just stay in bed. I'm going to make you breakfast. So in your mind, you're picturing organic fruit, smoked applewood bacon, avocado toast, perhaps, and you are super excited. And then when, when that person 
re-enters the room, this is what they bring you. And your first response in your head, hopefully, is, wow, this is not what I was expecting at all. And so what I did, because that, that was my response, I'll come clean here, and, but what actually came out of my mouth was, wow, where'd you come up with this idea? And my husband said, well, babe, you've been sad the past couple of weeks, and I just wanted to make you smile. And so when I was able to hear that, right, the other stuff didn't matter because it was the heart and the motive behind what he was trying to do. And while it wasn't exactly what my perfect breakfast in bed was, this, this was a priceless gift for what he was trying to offer. And so I think this is so translatable into the workplace because even as Omar said, right, if we're unwilling to to see the benefits and the good that other generations are bringing then we're never going to really get to the heart of who they are and what they're capable of most definitely so in order to make that happen um, i think that was an incredible illustration where it's really easy to um, kind of react defensively right? Like, what were you thinking? Why is this? <laughs> what in the world is this? <laughs> um, but your question was beautiful, right? Where you were really trying, trying to understand. And in that moment, because you understood, instead of immediately judging, although that might have been your initial response. <laughs> in my head, I was. <laughs> you kept that quiet. And so um, what we're suggesting is that we actually need to bring a new mindset or a new way of thinking to the workplace. So instead of having preconceived notions that millennials are this and Gen Z does that and whatever, um, it's just like with every other bias. When you put people in a box and you make assumptions about them, you can prove that all that stuff is really true or you can step back, ask some questions and understand the gift that they really bring to the workplace. So when you approach it with a different mindset, then we have a chance of having a different result which is achieving some of the gifts um, that each generation brings to the workplace. And um, that is going to be the subject of our next webinar, but I just wanted to provide just a couple of thoughts on that in terms of bringing a gift. Um, it's so easy to misunderstand, right? And that's where the, the recommendation that we're making is the asking of questions, the pausing and taking time to understand from others points of view um, because ageism, which is um, essentially bias against people of an age that's different than yours, yep. is the greatest diversity challenge in the workplace. And I had never thought about that, but depending upon what age you are, everybody's experienced it from all different directions. And so rather than automatically jumping to judgment, how do we understand the gifts that we bring? You know, and another example um, I heard, I was talking to a millennial where we hear all the time about millennials, oh, they turn over, they just quit their jobs. And what this millennial was sharing was that um, nobody promotes anymore, right? So there's not learning, there's not training, and there's not a career path to move up in the organization. And for this individual, she said, if I want to get ahead, I have to leave my job to get quote unquote promoted, right? By getting a new position at a higher rate of pay with a better title. So we can point to even statistics. Oh, look at the amount of turnover. But yet, if you don't pause and take the time to say what's going on behind it, we actually miss the real story. Yeah, and I think you, people would be surprised to see how loyal some millennials are, right? They're incredibly loyal when they're, when they're heard and seen and understood. Yeah. Yes, yes. And um, Clint talks about... Uh, having the expectations more clearly laid out. So that's actually uh, one of the recommendations that we have. Um, we are going to provide each one of you the follow-up message where you'll get a recording of the webinar, the slides, and a tool that we've created because we believe that having these conversations is absolutely essential to breaking down that bias in the, in the workplace. But in addition to that, before you um, try to understand somebody else's expectations, what about your own, right? How, what, what are you expecting? And a lot of times we respond 
before we pause and say, what is it that we think we want or need? And so we have two actions that we recommend, not only having these conversations and seeking to understand, but pausing and taking time to appreciate your own expectations. And have you seen that played out at all? Any examples come to mind for you? Well, I'm thinking about one, one uh, consistent theme I'm seeing, especially with women in the workplace, mm -hmm. is uh, boomer women who have really sacrificed a lot in their career to mm -hmm. get to the top, and they've, you know, they've done a lot. They've really paved the way forward for some Gen Xers and then obviously for millennials. So they, they kind of expect millennials to be grateful, I think, mm -hmm. and, and to understand what they've given up so that millennials could enter into the spaces where they mm -hmm. are. And I've had several conversations with boomer women who are incredibly successful and, but not understanding you know, they, they want to mentor these girls, but they don't under, or these millennials, but they don't understand kind of what they're projecting in terms of their anger or disappointment in the lack of appreciation for what they've done along the way. Mm -hmm. um, so that can obviously inhibit the relationship because the millennials want to learn from them actually, but mm -hmm. they're like, but I'm not sure you really want to teach me, mm -hmm. you know? So even just coming to the table and for both sides, for millennials to understand, it's important to honor the hard work that the people who've been on the road longer than you have mm -hmm. done. And, and in, in a lot of ways, you know, we stand on other people's shoulders, right? So we're benefiting from those who've gone before us. And then for older generations to understand, you know, even if you look at your, you know, if you have kids, they don't often appreciate you, right? Like that's not usually how it works. So mm -hmm. we need to, to be careful in our expectations in that way. That's a great example. And so what I'm hearing in that is that um, in that mentoring situation, the older person was, had gone through a lot in their career mm -hmm. and the younger person did not ask questions to understand their context. Um, and that was frustrating to the older person, mm -hmm. but then the older person didn't understand that the younger person had none of that experience mm -hmm. to even have a frame of reference. Right, right of what they went through right. and why it was a challenge and you mean things haven't always been this way right so that right there set them up in their mentoring relationship for some frustration yes a lot of frustration so that goes back to our recommendations in terms of understanding the gifts of each of the generations is first of all what are your expectations so for that um, older individual in the workplace they had an expectation that you're going to appreciate what I went through, right? Yeah. And for some, it might even be, well, you should have to go through it too. Abs yes. Have you encountered that? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and so this is something we were talking about before where there's almost a component of fairness, right? It's mm -hmm. I had to go through this, you know, and I'm sure we, for those who've been in the workplace for a while, we can all talk about stories. You know, I used to work in a, at Cooper's and Libran at a public accounting firm and, you know, the hours would get longer and longer and it, it became a badge of honor of how long you could work over the weekend, right? Yeah. Well, I put in these many hours yeah. and that's how things were at that time. Um, but it's different now. Yeah. And, and even to that, you know, millennials have watched their parents sacrifice a lot. Right. And now as boomers are getting older, they might have always wanted to travel, but now they can't. Maybe they have a health issue and they're watching. I mean, I hear mm -hmm. them. They talk about this constantly. And so they they want that quality of life now. Right. Mm -hmm. So the expectations and what they're willing to give up. Right. It. Right. So understanding what your expectations are mm -hmm. and that maybe what you're feeling is like it's not fair mm -hmm. that this next generation doesn't have to do what I do mm -hmm. and something to be aware of. Um, did not put this in the slides, but we talked about this. <laughs> um, there's actually neuroscience research that shows when you experience unfairness or you believe unfairness exists, it actually reduces your ability to have empathy for others. Mm. And so just pausing and saying, are my expectations, you should behave in this way. And when you don't, it's not fair. You have to understand kind of the psychological game that you're playing. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're suggesting in order to understand and receive the gifts 
that other generations bring. You first have to understand your own expectations. And then secondly, have the conversation to understand their expectations, where they're coming from. And as I mentioned, we're providing a worksheet that we developed um, that has some of the categories and some questions you might consider using as you're thinking about the next generation and how to break through some of the bias and assumptions. So if anybody has questions, um, we'd love for you to post those in the Q&A. Um, and we're going to start wrapping up here, but if there's anything anybody's curious about in terms of generations or assumptions that you've made that you experienced something different, right? So you had a story, Catherine, where um, I think it was in a, in a hospital situation, right? Where there was an assumption uh, about a response, yes. right? For some changes that were being made that turns out was completely different than what they initially expected. So will you share that with us? So a lot of hospitals do self-scheduling with their nurses. And I think this came up during a time of Gen Xers, right? Very independent. They are kind of their own bosses. So millennials were not necessarily responding well to it. They kept changing their shifts. So there was all this frustration. So then they decided to actually schedule out like two or three or four weeks. They mm -hmm. did it differently in different departments. And at first millennials hated it, but after they got through it, they loved it because now they had some expectation. They knew what was coming. So they could plan their life then mm -hmm. according to their work. And it wasn't this, oh, I got to respond. I got to do this. I got to mm -hmm. fix this. And, and so they're shifting the way they do their scheduling. Yeah. It's creating, and, and millennials love structure. So it's creating more structure for them. So that mm -hmm. then they're able to manage their life in different ways. Yeah, excellent example. So just reinforcing, um, when we talk about understanding your expectations, this is whether you're young or old, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's also a lot of younger people who get frustrated with folks in the older generation. And if you don't understand, they have different points of view than you. And sometimes you have to share your expectations and help them understand why you see things differently, yep. right? So um, there's a, a communication kind of graphic that we like to share talking about communication, you know, so you send a message and then there's an impact on the receiver and so on. But what we overlook is that shared context, right? Just because I'm yeah. sending you the message, you may receive it completely different because we have different contexts. And ultimately that's what we're getting at in this conversation is from generation to generation because of your growing up experience, the family, the organization, the economy, all those factors created a context that is different than somebody from another generation. So when we ask questions and we pause and understand why our expectations are different, that is incredibly helpful to maybe not getting on the same page because we may still have different perspectives, but at least we come from a place of understanding. And I would also add, you know, another thing I hear a lot is, well, they're, they're just young. It's just their life stage, but it's more than that. We have to pay attention to how technology is shaping the way we think about the world and the way we interact with one another. And that mm -hmm. is something new that's been really interjected in our culture in an extreme way in the past, you know, not so far away, <laughs> yes. you know, past. And yes. so we have to yeah, it's not, it's not just about youth anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Clint raises a really interesting point around the story that you shared, Catherine, which was the, the young person who didn't show up for that really important meeting mm -hmm. and saying, was that expectation set? Mm -hmm. See, and that's a perfect example exactly. of, of an older generation. You'd be like, of course, you know, you're supposed to come in. Right, right? this is how it works. We joined the status quo. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, but there's so many times when expectations are not clear um, it, it creates incredible confusion and, mm -hmm. and the leaders of all different generations misunderstand the responses because they didn't clearly set expectations. So, um, you know, as, as he made that comment, it made me think of the younger generation. We went to visit some friends a couple of weeks ago and, the, and their son was sitting playing his video game, but communicating because he was playing virtually with all his friends. Right. Right. So that's his experience in context growing up. Now he goes to the workplace and 
it's not unusual to be wherever, communicate, interact, and do your work from any place. Yep. But then um, there's, I work with a CEO of, who's in an older generation who believes that if you are not face to face, you know, looking at the other person that you are not going to work. You're and, not actually communicating yes. or getting things done. Yeah. Yes. So again, all these different expectations um, from generation to generation. And rather than just operate out of missed expectations, starting up front um, and understanding them so we are clear on the gifts that we bring. And that's why this, the generational conversation, we can't just dismiss it, right? We have to pay attention to it because it does impact things. And if we have no context for it, um, we're kind of ignoring the elephant in the room. Yes. Yes. Now, one of the um, elements of the title for this webinar was about culture. And it's something that we're going to be addressing in an upcoming webinar. But the reason for that is that the culture or the environment that you're in helps you either be the best that you can be in whatever your generation is, or you gave some examples of how people had to become something they were not in order to fit in. And so um, we're going to continue exploring this conversation, and we're actually going to be introducing an incredible, simple model of the key, three key factors that are absolutely essential for a generationally friendly workplace. So stay tuned for that. It's awesome. <laughs> Um, like we mentioned, you're going to be getting um, the information from this webinar. We're going to be inviting you to the next one, which is December 19th. And in that one, we're actually going to highlight the gifts of each generation. Um, there's far too much noise about the, um, the terrible things of this generation. And um, everybody's kind of pointing out the flaws generation to generation. And what we'd like to show you is very specific things that, um, for example, breaking down silos is a common frustration that I hear in the workplace. Did you know that there's a generation who naturally can do this, but yet there's companies hiring consultants like me to come in and help them break down their silos. And so we're going to talk about the gifts the generations bring at that uh, December webinar. And then we're going to be rolling out our culture model and share with all of you how to align your culture in such a way that it will be generationally friendly to everyone. So um, with that, we'd love to hear from you. If you have any questions or comments, you can reach us at hello at ourvoices.com. And our voices is because we want to hear from everyone. We believe that everybody should have a voice um, in the conversation, and that's why it matters. So any um, closing words of wisdom, Catherine? No, it's, well, yes, I would say, you know, seek to understand. And even just a simple question you can start with is, can you help me understand? Beautiful. That is a perfect conclusion. So take away for everybody, understand your own expectations, ask lots of questions. And Catherine's example, can you help me understand? is a perfect way um, for you to start using those questions and paying attention to how a different context because of generations can create misunderstandings. So thanks everyone for joining us. We look forward to connecting with you and having you join us in December. And in the meantime, have a wonderful rest of your day.